Welcome to today's rebroadcast podcast, number 52, titled, Importance of God's Message Amidst Challenging Circumstances, featuring Mike from COT. In today's episode, as per usual, Michael says what you're thinking and delivers a remarkable Revelation 20 analysis in a way no other apologist can. Our channel also features other esteemed speakers replayed on the End Generation Project, including our new 22 Degrees Exegesis Media original podcast called The Ultimate Weapon. Our premier podcast will showcase weekly episodes through discussions led by recovering addicts and alcoholics, as well as other guests and renowned speakers addressing topics like faith, what it was like then, what happened to them, and what life is like now. The EGP crew consists of five recovering addicts, with two of us dedicating many hours to produce just one of these videos. Once you see the stunning quality of our videos and subtitles in our podcasts, you'll understand why. We're privileged today to tap into the wisdom of the Council of Times host, Michael, whom is one of the most important Christian voices of this generation. For deeper insights, visit the official Council of Time website linked in the description. Join our mission of disseminating God's word and carrying a message of recovery to those still suffering from addiction around the world. We are here to bring hope in these critical and upside down times. Your support drives our mission and unlocks the transformative potential of living a meaningful life of truth and sobriety, preparing for what the Bible calls perilous times. Time to get prepared. If you enjoy these videos, we have a brand new Locals community now as well as Patreon. Please see our latest poll, then we have a better idea what our beloved viewers prefer. We have lots more information on that in the description. In short, we are blessed to have the chance to run a full-time channel thanks to our beloved subscribers. See the link in the description. All right now, before we get into today's rebroadcast podcast, Importance of God's Message Amidst Challenging Circumstances, Episode 52, a heartfelt thank you for your unwavering support. As we journey together, we're dedicated to keeping this podcast ad-free. Your support allows us to spread God's word high and wide. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and message us for daily excellence in your life. And never miss a podcast. You see, these simple actions are free and helps our mission so, so much to reach our audiences worldwide. Our podcasts are translated into over a dozen languages with some even being voice over dubbed. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Now, let's tune into today's repodcast titled Importance of God's Message Amidst Challenging Circumstances. Let's listen to the rebroadcast of End Generation Project Podcast, number 52 with Mike from COT. Blessings to all. Let's go, shall we? Good evening. To everybody out there, I hope you guys had a peaceful day thus far. We're going to go back into the book of Revelation. You guys ready for this? Could get a bit bumpy. Just forewarning you. That it could. That it could. All right, now, everybody, just so you know, I love the questions. But I want you guys to know that sometimes I cannot see or track your questions uh, too good, right? I get stuck. I talk too much. And um, so if you have a question during the time where we take those, just put it up there multiple times. I'll end up getting it, okay? I was going over the logs, and I have a, a way to look back at certain questions, and I saw one from BP, but I didn't see the rest, or something about BP or concerning BP's, um, uh, his, his opinion or outlook on something. I didn't get the rest of that. So if you guys happen to get that, let me know. Let me know. And just in case, you, if you don't know who BP is, he is very astute when it comes to uh, solar activity and anomalies, both on the earth and in the heavens. Very astute in those areas. So uh, he has a background. Uh, I believe he's an uh, electrical engineer, engineering background. So I knew it was about magnetism and voltage and and uh, things in our ionosphere. 
versus the lip, the thermal sphere, which is going to be one of the biggest subjects this year uh, in science that there's ever been. Just in case you don't know, in the thermal sphere, right? Uh, it is it's about 212 kilometers above the Earth, right? The ionosphere is about 40 miles above the Earth. The, uh, at the lip of the ionosphere to the uh, thermal sphere, temperatures are very hot. The ionosphere is the electrical field around the Earth, right? It's very charged. But there's a problem. The more we have density increases in the thermal sphere and the ionosphere, the hotter things you're going to get. Right? That's going to change your biology also. Just so you know that. Your biology is going to change. Ladies, I, I, I don't want to be the one to tell you this, but you're going to be impacted the most. All females are going to be impacted the most. Okay. So, uh, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be something you're going to have to deal with. Okay. That'll be something you really have to deal with. I will discuss the ionosphere and, uh, on a panel of sorts. <clears throat> Let's just say I'm being requested on a panel. Uh, for the USA in a type of conference for some decisions coming up, only because I was involved heavily in a certain type of work throughout my career, and so they need uh, evidently they need the guys who developed something. So anyway, we're going to see about that, but I know that the dangers of the change in the magnetic field, anything, anything biological will be affected by changes in the magnetic field. Everything biological is regulated by the electronic field around the Earth. Everything. It is intimately tied together. Without that electrical field around the Earth, without the plasma and the high electric discharges and lightning and all that, all that stuff, life as we know it would alter greatly. And it'd be an unfortunate thing. All right. So we'll cover that. We will be covering that. All these things you read in Revelation about uh, the happenings in the earth. I believe that it is minimized as far as what John saw. It is minimized. It's just minimized because there's a buildup before we ever get to the beast. Right. One thing I, you'll hear me stress over this week and next week is that before the beast steps on the scene, there are some things all life on earth must go through, right? And since there's always a, a governing time element behind changes in the earth, that means the time that we have to go through prior to the beast, that's going to be very tasking to humanity and indeed all life on the planet. So it's happening now, right? You're, you're right here. You have already entered into the time of the change in biology of everything in the earth. You're in it right now, right? You're not, you're not going to go into it. You're in it right now. In fact, if, if you guys would look back into the 1972-1980 records of what they were uh, forecasting regarding sustained temperature changes, uh, trend lines increased in, in ocean temperatures and everything else were already past marks. We're past the mark at which they said, uh, you know, the earth would begin to degrade exponentially, right? We're already in that time. If you guys could see the sensory data of the magma and how it's eating away the rock, causing massive disturbances in the earth, the only reason you don't feel all of it is because of the ocean and some of the underground uh some of the underground water bats, right? It acts as a cushion. Water absorbs vibrations, right? Without the water, you're going to feel all the vibrations. And so we're, we're entering into a time now where water is being lost. It's being trapped in the atmospheres. It's being almost uh, transduced in the upper atmospheres, right? Getting, being captured or broken down into particulates, being captured in the thermal sphere as, as far as that heavy particles are concerned. So we're certainly seeing 
the changes that will escalate beyond anybody's uh, forecasts. I know they're trying to, I know for a fact that uh, one of the major tasks of media is to focus on people issues and get away from geological issues. Have you guys noticed? There was almost like a order, right? Of course, they can't defy these things because they won't get paid. But if you take note, about 10, 15 years ago, they used to cover many things in the earth. You guys remember that? Many things they would cover in the earth. They would have specials um, as far as volcanism, jungles, things like that, right? They stopped doing all of it. The only thing you see now are these weird shows on, you know, Weather Channel or something like that pertaining to paranormal activity or the, the people getting caught in these rough storms. But they do not, they do not cover the changes in the earth. They can't, they won't do that. That would uncover um, much of what they're trying to get everybody to look away from, right? But that will slowly unfold. But all you have to do is remember what used to be in the media and and notice it now because a lot of it's missing. They will not cover those topics and subjects. They will not do it, right? They won't do it. Um, having said that, as we go into the book of Revelation, we'll start looking at the aftermath, right? Somebody say, can you tell us what women should expect? Well, some of you ladies who have finished a specific time, there's a reactivation effect or let's just say a shock effect, right, concerning the body and your uh, neurological system that will cause you heavy, 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 heavy moments, um, month to month, heavy moments, okay? In some cases, some people will experience continual moments for about 30 days. So it's going to be tasking. And that can be followed up by nothing, right, for a couple of months. It's, it's always women are tied to the sun. You're actually, your, your body responds to the activity in the sun. So if you track activity in the sun, you're going to understand your own body. I'll tell you something else. If you ever want to mitigate what you guys go through, you have to calm yourselves down from the inside out. That is a known medical fact that most women induce their own issues because of how they think. And if you can calm that down, right, if you can actually take hold of that and stop that, you're going to calm your entire system down, and you will not go through those moments. You, you may not know this, but every single month you go through a panic period. That's a panic period. That's actually a panic period, right? Which is why people become hostile, uh, agitated, all sorts of things, right? Now, medically, if anybody could ever take hold of that and stop that from happening, because you have to have your mind in peace itself. You have to make sure that nobody disturbs your peace. That's your personal responsibility, and you can do that no matter what's happening around you. But you've got to place yourself in a mental area. That is full of peace. If you do not, you're going to set off your brain. Every time you get agitated, you're going to change your own chemistry, and your body's going to respond in kind. So if you don't like that, then start changing it. You don't have to have that. I'm just telling you, you don't have to have that. More and more, people are beginning to overcome that in their lives, and it stops without medication, without surgery. It just stops. I'm telling you right now, your thoughts trigger things in your body. Your body responds to your thoughts. So if you can refrain from, but that, don't get offended, but paranoid thoughts, right? Refrain from paranoid thoughts. Um, in other words, ladies have a bad habit of always trying to find out what's about to blow up. Stop doing that. You have to tell yourself, listen, things are going to blow up, so let me not look for them. Let me just continue to live my life, having an understanding that things will blow up. Don't try to find those things that will blow up like you, because you can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, what about an old woman? It doesn't matter. You still have that same dormant chemistry, right? You still have that chemistry. That's just like, for example, uh, testosterone. You know how 
Um, right now in the medical fields, a lot of men and a lot of women lose estrogen. Men lose testosterone. They don't have to lose that. In your brain is the ability to trigger the production facilities of all hormones, right? And your body can manufacture that, but it's always going to be based off your thinking. For example, if a person, if a male gets depressed, his testosterone levels are going to begin to drop. That happens my way of depression. As soon as someone recovers from depression, right? And guess what? The levels go back to normal. So it begins in your mind. Your thoughts is how you perceive the world. It is really how you perceive the world. Now, now I'm going to challenge you. I want you to think of something. Of all that has taken place in your life, you have to seriously look at this. Most of your down days are from how you see the world, how you interpret the world. If you interpret the world as this place that's coming to get you every, you know, five minutes or you start counting too many losses, you're going to have a negative influence over your entire body. You will change your hormonal release systems or, or mechanisms. So you have to really look the world in truth and then embrace that truth. Here's the truth. There's always something evil that's going to happen in the world. Here's the truth. Evil pursues all of us. Here's the truth. Things are going to go wrong. Start saying, so what? Start counting what's gone right. Start counting what was beautiful, not what was ugly. Right? Have an appreciation. Raise your appreciation level for things. And don't look into the things that are about to blow up in your life. Don't do that. Don't say, well, this is going to blow up. This is going to blow up. Don't say that. Say, this is working right now. And this is working right now. If your appliances blow up, right? Say, well, thank you, Lord, for the times they did not blow up. Start changing everything. Start changing that perspective of how you see the world from negative which is what is obvious right to something very positive and real satan exists in this world now if somebody murders someone why in the world when i get depressed because somehow evil happened in the world of course it's going to happen in the world when it comes to politics why would i ever get upset because some politician did something just distasteful Right? If they're not washed by the blood of the Lamb, if they're not professing Christ in view, in, in, in view of all men, then of course they're going to do things like that because they're under the wrong covering. I expect them to, right? Now, every day they don't do something ugly or, or terrible or something like that, I'll say, thank you, Lord. You know, they didn't do that today. Thank you, right? And what I'm telling you is this. Expect evil to be evil. Expect darkness to be darkness. Expect coldness to be coldness. Expect those things to be there and don't focus on them. Have the wisdom to know that they are in operation. They are there. But never take inventory of evil or of darkness. Don't look at something that happens on TV and say, well, I wonder what that person was thinking when they did that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Right? Because what you'll do is you'll start changing the chemistry in your body. Your body obeys you all the time. It does that by way of your thinking. And how you think will make the difference between you being healthy or not. Every sick person, every sick person, listen to me, th this is a big one. Every person out there who has a perpetual sickness, they also are dissatisfied with many things in their lives. Why does that always go hand in hand? I've seen people with cancer who had a very positive attitude, and now they don't have cancer, not because of chemo. I will not lift you above the light anymore, because essentially what you're doing, when you allow yourself to get a bad attitude, when you allow yourself to get depressed, when you allow yourself to get in these moods, you're exalting darkness over light. Do you know that? You're doing that. You are doing that. Come on, folks. Think about that. You're exalting darkness over light. Think about it. When you lift up something above everything else, it becomes you. So when you're running around depressed at something that happened, 
in the past, by the way, which no longer exists. You're exalting that evil, that effect of that evil, and that thought over everything else, even the good, even the light, even the Lord Jesus Christ. If we had Jesus on his throne, every step of the way, there's no way we'd ever be depressed. Because we would not exalt anything above him. When you exalt something, are you not magnifying it, making it bigger? Hmm? You make it bigger to yourselves. And when you make that bigger to yourselves, it becomes the heaviest thing in your life, the biggest thing in your life. It affects you deeply. Now, knowingly, you would not, you would not elevate nor magnify any evil or any darkness, would you? Knowingly, you would not do that. You wouldn't do that. But here is the deal. People do that anyway. And they ignore the fact that they're doing it. And it eats them up from the inside out. It will kill you. It will destroy you. It will cause you to decay in every aspect of what's called life. It will. So be aware of it, but do not exalt it over God's light, over the Lord's goodness, over his truth, right? That, that it doesn't mean be a crazy person with a smile on your face. Everywhere you go, that's not what it means. It means be aware of the evil, but start being thankful. Instead of magnifying an evil thing and get an attitude, magnify the goodness of the Lord and give him praise for it. Real praise. Say thank you. Be thankful for the smallest things in your life. Stop counting everything that went wrong. Be thankful for the one thing that went right. If you do that, there are principles that will take immediate effect in your life. Have you noticed that when you're depressed, when, when one thing breaks down and you get depressed, everything starts breaking down? Have you noticed that? I used to say that to myself. You know, I heard a guy say, you know, bad things happen in threes. Of course, I don't believe in that nonsense, but that's what he said, right? So I kind of looked into it. And I said, well, no wonder, because when something bad happens, people start looking for worse things to happen. They get affected by this. They shy away from the light and all goodness. They won't allow themselves to love freely anymore. They, they get closed off. And by doing that, they attract everything in the darkness. See, when you begin to mimic darkness, you become a home to everything in the dark. And sure enough, when you cut that off, here's what happens. When one bad thing happens, all goodness floods in. All goodness will flood in and overwhelm your life. Surely I'm not the only one who applies these small principles and has the benefit of receiving them. Hmm? Surely I'm not the only one. My, my. People are frightened of Revelation because of all the bad things happening. They can't even see the blessing in Revelation. Every time I read Revelation, I think of this is the close. This is the end of the matter. All of humanity has existed. And this is the close of the book. This is awesome. Right? It's like watching a movie. You know that the main character, right, is going to be victorious. You just don't know how. Understanding Revelation is to understand how that main character is going to be victorious. When you watch a movie, you accept the movie. You do. You just watch how everything unfolds. Do you know your life is much like that? You're learning how everything unfolds. But the ending has been declared from the beginning. The ending has been declared from the beginning. Does that sound familiar? The ending has been declared from the beginning. So it's already done. It's already done. We're just living the events in truth. And they're unfolding. Hmm? That's your challenge. Try it. 
and when your life changes. Because anybody who does that, I'm telling you right now, your life is going to change. And when it changes, don't forget to tell everybody else. They're not going to believe you at first because most people have established great negativity in life. And it's very difficult for them to transition. But when the difference comes, and it will come, don't forget to tell everybody else. Hmm? Don't forget to tell everybody else. Don't forget. Somebody said, Mike, when you stand with your Lord, right? Not the Lord standing with you. And you have to decide to stand with him. A lot of people say, well, the Lord's with me on this. No, you got to be with the Lord on this. You stand with the Lord, and he will stand with you. He's not going to follow our ideas. He has an established gospel. We need to stand with him. And when you do that, even in the most hostile of situations, you will witness people fall to your left and to your right. You will. You will. But if you are trying to make the Lord stand with you, you may fall. I've been through both those scenarios. Once you stand with Jesus, right? Because every problem becomes an alarm clock. And you say, oops, let me go stand by Christ. I have drifted just a little bit too far. And he's very accepting. Once you do this, and he instantly forgives, he does. Once you do this, right, you will then be the one who stands, and you won't be affected by what's happening around you. And then it will happen again. And then it will happen again. If you stand with the Lord, not if you say, well, the Lord's standing with me, huh? -uh. you got to get up and go stand with the Lord. You have to agree with the Lord. The Lord is only in agreement with you if you align yourself to the Father. God is, or Christ is always aligned with the Father's word, not ours, lest we align ourselves with the Father's word. Right? Jesus said, if you keep his commandments, the Father and him will make their abode in you, and they will sup with you. Now listen, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, not bondage. One of the major keys ever, you have to analyze your own activities to yourself. You have to analyze that. When you're feeling not so good, you have compensators. And you make sure that you have those compensators, whatever that be, for some it's hobbies. For some, it's a, a product. For some, it's a type of drink. You have compensators. And you'll make sure you have those compensators. Are you making sure that all those around you can deal with life also? Hmm. Somebody, come on now, somebody has to bring up something and say, well, what if you don't love yourself? If you don't love yourself, you would not be alive. You wouldn't have the ability to hear me. Do you know that? Loving yourself is not hugging yourself all day. That's not what that is. Loving yourself is your continuance in life. No matter what you think of yourself, you're still alive. How are you alive? I'll tell you how. Because when it came down to it, you went and got something to drink. When it came down to it, you had to get some type of shelter. When it came down to it, you had to go and get something to keep yourself alive. Do you have that same outlook, that same view on somebody else's life? No matter how you look at it, the Lord was quite clear. He didn't say love your neighbor as somebody else loves them also. Nope. He said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you can only love someone within the understanding and within the truth of how you love yourselves. So do that to your neighbor. It never said treat everybody better than you treat yourself. No. 
do to everybody else. How you do to yourself. And you do protect yourself. And you do feed yourself. Hmm? So that's the thing you are true. That's why you can't compare yourself to somebody else. Their level of love and what they understand as love is going to be different than yours. Just be truthful with it. Be real with it. You want a change in your life? Drop the facade. Don't fight the word of God. Embrace it. And enjoy it. Don't fight the word of God. You guys know the other one is to love the Lord your God with all of what you are. Actually, it's broken down with all your strength, right? With, with I'm saying everything you are, because that's with all of what powers you. How easy is that? Then Jesus confirmed it, didn't he? Hmm? Didn't he? Oh, but by the way, somebody says, wait a minute, let me go back, because we'll cover this too, because somebody says, um, somebody says, four commandments to God, six commandments to man. Well, Jesus summed all the commandments up in one thing. Does anybody know what that is? He said, all the commandments are summed up in this. And then he said something. Anybody know what that is? He said, all the commandments are summed up in this. And he told us what that was. But I'm telling you right now, and the truth is, let's go ahead and face the truth. Based on how somebody treats us, we repay them evil for evil. Tip for tat, don't we? Let's tell the truth. If somebody backstabs you, you cut them off. That's almost like saying, I'm not going to love you. I'm not going to love my enemy. No, they made themselves an enemy. I'm not going to love that enemy. Oops. See, that's the world's teachings. That's what the world calls common sense. I'll tell you something about common sense. God didn't give you common sense. He gave you holy, a holy sense. How about that? That's above and beyond. What is common to man? Common sense is the sense a dog would have, the sense a cat would have, the sense a monkey would have, the sense a raccoon would have. God made you so much more than they, didn't he? These phrases, they seem so clever, but all they do is keep you locked in a perpetual circle of falling and getting up and falling and having an attitude and falling and experiencing darkness and crying. And then you smile, only be backstabbed. And then you're affected. You are not to be moved by somebody backstabbing you, somebody trying to kill you, somebody doing this, that, and the other to you. Time for us to step into what the Lord, what the Lord has prepared for us to be. He has predestined all of us, and he did not predestine us to be what we want, but what he wants. And the world is designed to keep you in a small, fenced-in area. Who wants free of that? Half, most of you are sick and tired of the same old, same old. You've asked the Lord to change it, and the Lord is telling you, you've got to accept what he has already laid out for you. But let's go ahead and face this truth. Haven't we been fighting the word of God more than embracing the word of God? Huh? You know, when somebody says, well, I don't understand why the Lord would ask. That. You don't understand because you don't want to do. Let's go ahead and, and, and confess that. There are plenty of things we do not want to do because we find them inconvenient at that time for that circumstance, situation, or lifestyle. Let's go ahead and tell that one the way it is. Sometimes we don't want to conform, because if we do, we lose our earthly happiness. Sacrifice time. A person who believes has no problem in sacrificing. A person who does not believe will not sacrifice. It'll never be worth it. When you trust the Lord, right? When you really do trust the Lord. You're not going to have your bridge built behind you just in case the word of the Lord fails. Hmm? 
Come on, that's part of your breakthrough moment, isn't it? It's part of your breakthrough moment. This is the unpopular stuff. These are the things we read about. Let's skip over. Let's get to the other stuff. It does not include me having to change anything about my own path. Hmm. Hmm. We challenge God. We do. More than anything else. Now, here we have something again, something curious. This word love again. Loving the Lord our God with all of our might, our strength, right? Our power, our heart. How do you do that? How do you love the Lord your God with everything that you are? Ah, listen to me. This is a beautiful one. With every skill set, with every ability, with everything that you are. Love the Lord your God. Now, that's not to declare something with your lips. Love is an action word. Did you know that? Love is action. Love is not just one thing. No. Love is a conveyance, a seal of everything you are. Love is action. To love the Lord your God, right, to, to really love him, we know that appreciation is in there. We know that reverence is in there, right? There are people I love right now, and I have a type of reverence for them. Do you know that? A high degree of respect. There are people I have a high degree of respect for that most of the world would not take a second look at. That's a fact. I do not love people by what they have done or what they have not done. I love people by how God made them. I see beyond the deeds, beyond the sin, even beyond the good deeds of a person. I see what the Lord put in them. I see what surfaces from time to time. See, I've found something out. Even in the worst person, there's a small spark. Tiny little spark. And because that's what I look for, I can see it. It surfaces from time to time. Most people conceal that because of their past, because of their environment, because of their wounds, because of what they have gone through. They conceal it, but it's still there. I have a high degree of respect for that spark. Because that spark is there by the hand of the living God and no one else. It is that spark that causes even some of the worst people to have the greatest compassion. To sacrifice so much of themselves. If you were on a mission to love your neighbor, the Lord would open your eyes to who is who. Do you know that? He would. He would allow you to see who is who if you were on a mission to love your neighbor. He would open your eyes. You're in those times now. You want to be untouched in the coming weeks? Apply yourselves. Watch what you sow. Don't sow so you can get something you think you need. Sow in truth. Let the Lord handle how he takes care of you. Sow in truth. We know what the Lord said. Whatever we sow, we're going to reap. Sow in truth. Do that with all things. And have that change in your life. If it's one thing I look for, it's that breakthrough in your life. I want somebody to come back. I want somebody to just lose control. I just love to see it. When people say, I cannot believe all these years, because that's what, no, that's what people normally come back and say. They'll say, all these years, I've been trying everything. All these years, 
And they'll say, are you kidding me? I do that one little alteration and everything breaks free. And all these years, one person said, I've been trying to conform to everything God wrote. And everything still went downhill. As soon as they made the little tiny changes for instructions of Christ, they were free and so were their children. Like some miraculous wave came through and altered everything because God's not playing with his word. Christ was not lying. You obey the Lord. You will have the Lord's results in your life. Period. Whatever you obey, that's what you have the results of. Are you dissatisfied with your life? Go well, listen again to the Messiah. He is the last authoritative word that we were given. The Messiah. Not anybody else. The Messiah. I do not subscribe to anybody else having any authoritative word but the Messiah. Lord knows I've gone so many different avenues in my life, but the one thing I never did was compromise with Messiah. I just didn't obey him. But the moment I did, he did things I can't even tell. I cannot tell you guys what he did. It's not useful to you until you begin to experience it yourselves. You wouldn't believe it. You would not believe it. In fact, if any of you were near me every single day of your life, you would not believe the life I live. You would say, that's impossible. And I would smile and say, no, it isn't. You're a witness. I'm saying that with a smile on my face. Do you know why? Because when people see it, they cannot believe it. They got so much of the world within them that they never really trusted that miraculous way of the Lord. The simplicity of its instructions are the most powerful thing we could ever encounter. His small statements can break the back of all demons in your life. The slightest compliance and obedience can free everything you ever touch. And your father stands ready to act in your life on your behalf. When you're ready to embrace completely the Messiah, he's prepared and ready on your behalf to act. He awaits you. He's awaiting you. He's waiting for you to take that step of faith, for you to employ the words of Christ. For you to uncomplicate your life. Because people have been living in that complicated life. And look. Look at where they are. On the inside. See, on the outside, you can prosper all day long. But I'm telling you right now, I've seen a lot of prosperous people dead on the inside. How about you guys? I've seen it. I have seen it. There are millionaires right now who, who they're so miserable that they drink themselves to pieces. Why do all millionaires have to drink in the first place? Compensators. They're not free either. They're always stressed. Always trying to maintain some standard. They can't even be themselves. They can't be themselves. They're at the breaking point every day of their lives. But in view of people, they look like, hey, that's what I want to be. But you can't see the inside. The Lord doesn't want you that way. He wants you absolutely 100% free. Hmm. Liz says, what do you do when you get screwed over so much by people that grow cold emotionally towards most people? My guy, people like that all the time. All the, do you think, do you think a person who once held a prestige professional position, right? Who turned his back on the whole thing because of the Messiah. Do you think that person would ever gain the respect of individuals who still hold those positions? No. No, they wouldn't. Do you think that when you take that position of the Lord and you will not agree to hate other people, 
I know we're talking about people who make decisions for other folks. Do you think that any of those people are going to befriend the one? No, they won't. People will kick you to the curb so quick when you do not align with them. Man, you guys know I have foot and mouth disease. I put my foot in my mouth all the time. And when people have a consensus on something, normally I do not. I can't just blindly agree with people. Also, when you have compassion and you stand ready to forgive, people take that as a weakness, as a vulnerability, and they will take full advantage of it all the time. All the time. Do you hear me? All the time. All the time. And they will stab you in the back so deep your back will be missing. When I have a problem in life, I have to go to the Lord. There's no one else I'll go to. I'll go to the Lord, right? That's where I go. When everything falls down, nothing stands. I have to go to the Lord. Damn. You guys don't hear me crying, do you? I'm backstabbed at least once a week. Betrayed, right? You you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. But that's the way it is. Best expected. Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care. You have to realize something. Jesus told us the truth. He said the world hated him. So then if that same word that was in Christ and that spirit that was in Christ is in you, they're going to hate you too. Why would you expect people not to backstab you? Hmm? When you live your life for the word of God, Satan is surely your adversary. And Satan will work through anybody at a moment of weakness. And he's not going to go through the stranger. No, because you could just blow that one off. No, he's coming right for those who are closest to your heart. So what you might want to do is never live the illusion, saying, well, this person will never betray me. This person will never do this. And this person, stop saying that. Don't say that because you set yourself up for failure. You've got to realize that everybody around you in a moment of weakness can be utilized by the enemy. Always remember that. So that when somebody backstabs you, you can say, hey, I know you just backstabbed me, but um, I'm forgiving you from that. Let's move on to the next thing. Because when you can forgive someone of something they did that's awful, do you not know that the Lord intervenes in the heart of the one you have forgiven? Listen, when you forgive a person who has really backstabbed you, right? Your father goes to work. I'm telling you, he goes to work. And that same person that backstabbed you can be end up being your closest ally. Do you hear me? But don't expect darkness to somehow embrace you and to be light to you. Don't expect that, right? When you take your expectations out of the fairy tale and you put them in the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are rejuvenated. You are quickened. You are on your feet and ready to go. But if we continue to believe in falsehoods, in this world-made self-help doctrine, right? We're always going to be let down. We're going to run around with our heads down saying, oh, it's me. I can't take another step. I'm t Let's tell the truth. There are a lot of people who are out there. They are tired, but, but, but that don't let me offend you. I don't want to offend you. The reason why most people are tired is because they did not get their results. They were trying to get a specific result in life, and they did not get it. And they're saying, I'm tired, because every time I try, it does not come out the way I want it to come out. I'm not that way, and I'm not tired. I'm not looking for my results to come out. No. I'm, I'm looking for the Lord to do what he does. I don't need to know all of what he does. Right? 
He didn't assign me to have a checklist to check off everything he does. And so guess what? I'm not tired. I'm not worn out. The only time I get really discouraged is when I believe I'm failing you. Then I'm making no difference in your life. So I tend to work a little harder. Do a little more. Because that's my, that, that is my discouragement. To be ineffective. But as far as being tired, because, you know, I don't see things going my way. No way, Jose. I'm not tired of, of darkness or anything else. That doesn't make me tired. People murdering and killing and stealing and all that doesn't make me tired. I expected that. That is in the Bible. I expect the word of the Lord to come true. All of it, the darkness and the light. Isn't it God who said, I created the good and the evil? Yes, he did. He said, I created the good and the evil. The Lord did that. The good and the evil. Not just the good, but the evil too, because he uses all of it. So I leave all that in his capable hands. He gave me a small task. He did. And he said, if you believe in me, then take my message to the world. Right? That's what he said. And Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Right? So then we walk in the world putting on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. Remember Ephesians six eleven, that famous scripture? Right? And the armor of God is not my armor, it's his armor. So my compliance and obedience with him is my armor. Hmm? Somebody says, don't think you're failing. That will all, listen, listen, that will always be, there will never come a time when I say, ah, it was just so good, that last talk. Are you kidding? This word is holy. I have no business handling a holy word. I'm in an unholy vessel, but I'm handling a holy word, right? So I'm on pins and needles when it comes to the word of God, which is why I'm not full of theories and everything. I can't be, can't do that. I get too nervous. That is a holy word. Right? That's a holy word. That word is everything to me because that word is the Savior, and the Savior is the word of the living God, the Creator. And so I have fear of the Lord, a high respect of the Lord. So I'm always going to be on pins and needles handling that holy word of God. It is not my word. I will never wield it as though it's my word. It's not my word. That's the Lord's word. It is a living word. So, yeah, I, I am on pins and needles and nervous. And there are often times I feel I failed right after a talk. That's a fact. That's a fact. I will feel I just messed the whole thing up. And then out of God's graces, right, people will start sending something, right? Because it, it'll be instantaneous. But then the answers don't come back for about a week, a month, or something like that. And then all of a sudden, somebody points back to a date, and they say, you know, on this date, I had my breakthrough. And then I just, I go into a praise moment. Until that praise moment, I'm on pins and needles. But this is a holy word. I know a lot of people out there have lost their reverence, their respect, their fear of the Lord. I have not. I have not. The word of God is very real to me. Extremely real. Okay, now I'm going to take a small break. We're going to come back and go right into Revelation. Right, right into Revelation. Somebody says in Revelation 8, 10, the fountains of water spoken about. Is that the water inside the earth? I'm talking about, well, I'll tell you what, after the break, we'll look into that. Right? Because this water issue, the water thing is named as to what it is. It is already named. If the water is named, there are several elements that are named. And when you're having a dream, right, when, when anybody is having a dream, God was showing John something. He was showing John something. John wrote down what he saw. Right? So he saw something, just like we have 
dreams or visions, he will see something and they have a meaning. And it just so happens that the angel gave him the meaning to what he saw. Thank God for that, right? The angel gave him a meaning, told him what he saw. It's just like the woman. He said, don't marvel about the woman you saw sitting on the seven hill. I'll tell you the mystery of that woman, right? So he, there's an interpretation to that, just like the book of Daniel. We read about the dreams of Daniel, but then the next chapter or two, you see the, the interpretation of that dream, which is a blessing. And when you see that, there are these consistent elements in there like water, right? Water in Revelation in several places stands forth in many people's tongues and nations. That's what the water is the people of the earth, the nations of the earth, right? All these things in the earth. And the beast, the first beast comes out of the water, right? So he comes out of the people, out of the nations. So then the people of the earth and the nations of the earth constitute or make the first beast. See how that works? So it's not one person that's made out of many people and many nations, Right? Many languages, many tongues of the earth. It's right there that when the angel gives that interpretation to all the 144,000, the interpretation to the 144,000 is right there in Revelation. Right? But that's why I, a lot of people have an idea about the 144,000. I have to listen to what the angel had, had given to John because the angel told John who they were. And that's what I have to believe. Right? That's what I'm given. And that's what I accept. I'm a very simple person. I'll be back in a few minutes, though, folks, right after this break, and we'll go right into Revelation. I'll be right back. We're back again. Let's go. Let's go in Revelation, shall we? Let's go there. We were, we were in Revelation 19 going into 20, right? Let me read the last part of 19. Can I do that? And then we'll go back after after we read Revelation, guys. We're going to have lots of questions for summaries. Or se actually, several summaries. Okay? Because this time in Revelation, it's important that we see the dynamic of all the chapters. That's why I have to do my homework, or did my homework. And so that review, hopefully, will condense in sections Revelation so you can see how it's flowing, how it's unfolding. And we will match areas of Revelation with identical areas of Revelation so we can see how that how sometimes a narrative goes into detail into a specific part of Revelation. Okay? We'll do that. But Revelation nineteen nineteen. And I saw a beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against this army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that have received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. Again, let me highlight something. Who does the beast deceive into believing him, right? Remember, remember what Paul said, God shall send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie that they all might be damned who loved not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here it is. Anybody who has pleasure in unrighteousness, they're the ones that will be given over to a strong delusion. That strong delusion is a belief in the beast. Revelation 19, 19, this beast, right? And the kings of the earth and their armies were gathered to make war against him that sat on the horse. And the horse and his army, right? So Christ and his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. Now we know all those who received the mark of the beast are not written in the book of life. Right? They're not in the book of life. And it, so it says the, uh, the beast was taken, the false prophet, and those that were deceived... Who had the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of the fire burning with brimstone. So only those who took the mark, right? Those are the ones who go with the beast. Which hints, and Paul again says, God shall send them a strong delusion. This beast is rising by decree of the Most High. Right? By decree of the Most High. And the remnant, listen, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. They were slain. 
and the sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That was the end of 1921. Now, here comes the important part. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit with a great chain in his hand. And laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that it should deceive the nations no more. Listen, he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, this is interesting. You ready? When the beast is gone and the false prophet is gone and all those that were with him who received the mark are gone. Right? Satan is bound a thousand years and a seal is set upon him. Now with the seal set upon him and because he's bound he cannot deceive the nations no more. He cannot deceive the nations anymore. Right? Now when he can't deceive the nations the world is different. It's different. Listen. And I saw the thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them, the souls of them, that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received this mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, if the saints are reigning with Christ and Christ is reigning, righteousness is in the earth. But here's what you got to see. Righteousness is in the earth just with a snap of a finger as soon as Satan is bound. And it says Satan, because he's bound and a seal is put upon him, he cannot deceive anybody anymore. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. That means... All the sin in this world is coming from one source. And when a person does sin, they agree with that source. When that source is bound, no one is sinning. When that source is bound, no nation, no people is deceived anymore. Now that does not speak well of us right now. Something we need to get right now, that every single time, we agree to sin. We are in agreement with Satan himself. Sin is not something floating in the air that people just do. Uh-uh. It's coming from a source. And when that source is bound, no one is deceived. That means no one is full. Of, we don't have these issues and alterations and questions and this, that, and the other. So in truth, we know there's an influence that gets to us. Come on, folks. An influence we can say no more. My, my. See, somebody got it. Somebody said that puts it into perspective. My, my. See? So when Satan is gone, when Satan is gone, all is well. All is well. But when Satan, he, he's not gone right now, he's loosed. He is the source of this darkness, of all this negativity, all everything else you can mention, he is the source. And when we agree with him, that's why Jesus said, it, right, a man can, it, we don't sin, this is not sin by itself. We must agree to it for it to be sin. So when we stop our agreement with sin, with this source, that is sin, which is Satan. All is well. All is well. Do you guys see that? So when Satan is bound a thousand years, there's a thousand years of what? Thousand year reign of righteousness. Hmm? Mm. My goodness. So in truth, if Jesus had not called us out of deceit itself. There's no way we would ever be free. No wonder it says we were once deceived. 
A wonder, it says, Jesus came that we may have life and have life more abundantly because we did not have life. Jesus called us out of the world, so that really gives us a definition of what the world really is in accordance with the word of God. No wonder it states to be a friend of the world is to have enmity with God because it is the place of deceit. No wonder those in the world who do not agree with Christ, they have such death, carnage, and chaos. Yet they call it what? Righteousness, don't they? You listen, if you listen to the world, the world will have you saying that murder is righteousness. It is not because it operates from that source, not from the blood of the Lamb. No wonder it says the time that we live in right now, they're calling evil good and good evil. No wonder. The calling right, wrong, and wrong, right. Because it is backward in the world. It truly is darkness. It truly is chaos. When Satan is bound a thousand years, no one is deceived anymore. Can you imagine Satan being bound and all of a sudden everybody has clarity? Because they're not fighting evil thoughts. They're not fighting agitation. They're not fighting irritation. They're not fighting blame. They're not fighting depression. They're not fighting anything of darkness. Absolute clarity. Can you imagine that? Hmm? Now listen. Listen. It says... All the thrones and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon the foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Listen, blessed and holy is he that hath put, that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power did you guys get that oh, here we go again listen but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection and then he says blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection the first resurrection so let so so understand the situation the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Those who were asleep in the earth, right? So we're dealing with two sets of people. Come on, folks. Come on, folks. We're dealing with two sets of people. We have the people that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast. So there are saints living in the time of the kingdom of the beast. There are saints living in the time of the kingdom of the beast. And they did not receive the mark. They did not worship the beast. And they were killed for it. Point blank. And then we have some who died well before that. These are the ones who lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Hmm? Are you with me? They did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. Do you hear me? Those who have part in the first resurrection are those who live with Christ. Because it ju he just said, Blessed are they, blessed are they who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And it just said, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, you see that. You see that? Revelation 26, they reign with them a thousand years. Revelation 24, they reign with them a thousand years. 
who is reigning with him a thousand years, those who have part in the first resurrection, those who were killed in the time of the beast. Now, do you remember at the beginning of Revelation, it says, who are, who are all these red and white? These are they who came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. My goodness. They will forever be with the Lamb. Now, we just read here, right, that, that these people are going to be priests, right? They're going to be priests of God and of Christ. That's why they are forever with the Lord. Are you starting to see it? And that's at the beginning of Revelation. Now we're getting the details. And what has happened to them? Revelation has given us a context. Now, why am I getting like this? Because a lot of people have listened. They have listened to the threats of Satan himself and have forgotten about the power of the living God. And a lot of them are saying, a lot of them are saying, oh, let me get out of here before anything happens. Why would anybody ever say that when it is Christ who is unleashing all of it? Really? Are we really that shallow to believe that Christ would unleash this upon his own people to harm them, to permanently scar their souls? No. This is why people need to experience the deliverance of the Messiah now. And the only way that's going to happen is when you walk out on faith and be an experiencer of what God can do. Those children that were beheaded by ISIS, why were they smiling? Because they clearly asked them, do you renounce Christ? And those kids said, no, we do not. And they were beheaded by ISIS, smiling. And it irritated, aggravated, and scared the people who were beheading those children. What about the apostles? Who gets crucified and hung, hung up on a cross and they say, whoop, wait a minute, whoop, wait a minute, I know my wrist is hanging off and my leg is over there in the ground, but, but, but please hang me upside down. My Savior was crucified this way and I'm not worthy of it. So hang me up. Nobody has a thought like that in the middle of all the torment that they're going through unless God did something to them. So you got to be a witness of God's deliverance to know this. You got to be a witness. Stop believing when you stub your toe. That's the pain you're going to feel multiplied by a thousand if somebody comes up and beheads you. You're forgetting the power of the living God. I know what it is to suffer as a sinner, and I know what it is to have suffering as a believer. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. When you suffer as a believer, there's no way your father's not involved. Your father in heaven can separate you from the body you're in while you're still in the body. Stop thinking about having some painless thing and think about your dedication, your absolute dedication to your faith in Christ. You know who's scaring you? Satan is. God is not scaring you. Satan is scaring you. Satan has everybody so scared. They're trying to escape the pain that they perceive in Revelation. Satan has given a message that's scaring people to pieces. God is giving us what? What is he giving us? Finality. Deliverance. Satan is the one with the message, scaring people to pieces. Yes, he got to you when you were young. Yes, he got to you as an adolescent, and he had you go through some pain. Yes, you stubbed your toe. Yes, you broke your leg, and it hurts. Stop thinking that your father is going to sit there and have you endure a tormentive time like that before your transition. Stop doing that because you don't know. And if you don't know, you have not experienced what God can do. I, I would go so far as to say, many of the ministers out there will tell you they are supposed to be dead. They have gone through some torment. But when the Father is with them in the torment, that's what you call it, torment. That is not what they call it. That's not what I call it. Why do you think they run around loudmouth so much? Because they're not afraid. Why? Because they experienced the deliverance of the Messiah. Women go through childbirth. You have to have that pain. It is declared upon you. That has nothing to do with your transition. 
you're likening your pain in the flesh to your transition. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. Because you don't know. If you're frightened of the end that you're going to be in pain, then you simply don't know. You don't know. Anybody who builds their dedication upon truth, no matter what the circumstances are, all this thinking of pain and torment and everything else is gone. And God will fulfill his side because you fulfilled yours. You keep Christ on his throne in truth. He'll be on his throne with you always and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. Satan has given you the message of fear. Why do you think he got to you before that age of accountability? Before you absolutely settled it in your heart that, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what. No matter what. He got to you early. You felt the pain, the anguish, the torment then. You're not that little person anymore. You're not that person who was double-minded anymore. That's not who you are. It's not who you are. It's not not part of a trial itself to see if you're going to trust him with all your heart or not. Why would the Lord invite anybody in the kingdom of God that would not trust him with all of what they are? If, if it were my kingdom, if somebody couldn't trust me, they would not step foot in the kingdom. The Lord's word says that if we have no trust for him, we're not stepping foot in the kingdom. And the only way we're going to finish this thoroughly is to fully trust him. See, it's time to fully trust him now. And when you fully trust the Lord, that's when you say, Jimmy, crack corn. Somebody can tell you where they're going to lock you up and cut your arms off so God's will be done. But I'm here to obey him. I'm not running. No more running. No more hiding. No more. No more agreeing with the crowd because of fear of them. No more. See, now it's time to be dedicated. The only time a person is truly dedicated is when they have foregone all thoughts of what they may go through and they say, Lord, I will follow you anyway. But if you're saying, Lord, I'll follow you, unless, that's not full dedication. That is not full trust. Can you all see that? See, that's a dangerous position. And do you know what happens when you're no longer in that dangerous position where you can be double-minded? Your Father in heaven is just, and he will lift whatever remnants of darkness and that residue in your life, it has to go. That's when decay leaves. That's when the quickening comes. When you are dedicated. So we cannot say, Lord, I'll stand with you unless. That's not trust. Trust is when you say, Lord, I'm gonna, and no matter what comes, I'm going to do my best. You don't have to make some big declaration. Well, no matter what comes, they can come chop my head off and with my head chopped off sideways, I'm going to follow you. Stop doing that. You don't know what you'll do. The truth is you don't know what you can do. You say, Lord, I'm dedicated. I'm dedicated. I don't know what I'll do. But in my heart, I'm going to follow you all the way. That's what you do. Is that not the truth? And then you act on that. And you begin to follow him. And you live your life as such. Hmm? But stop saying I'll follow you uh, until. Well, I don't know if I'm going to continue to follow. Because I've stopped doing that because of. That little bit of trust that you have right now cause it to grow. You plant that trust in Christ and let it grow. 
Let it grow. Stop waiting until your trust has bloomed and blossomed. You didn't even put it in any soil. There's no water. So plant that seed in honesty and holiness of all of what you are. And say, Lord, here I am. But I know this is about commitment now. I want to trust you all the way. I'll begin that process. And you start trusting him. You want to see the Lord's results in your life? Then start trusting him. Start tr stop, stop challenging him. Stop saying in the back of your mind, well, if you just show me this, then don't do that. You take one foot forward in faith and say, Lord, I trust you. There are no conditions. I want to trust you. So I'm taking this step. That's how it begins. When you go to another human being, you don't know if you can trust someone or not. Do you know how, do you know how trust is built? It's built by faith. Because the truth is, you don't know who that individual is. So what do you do? You take a step by faith. They don't betray you. You say, ah. You take another step by faith. They don't betray you. Ah, ah. You take another step by faith. They don't betray you. Ah, ah, ah. More trust, more trust, more trust. Do you see that? You don't know who this other person is. You don't know who anybody else is. But what you do is you take a step of faith in whatever you're doing. And every time they do not betray you, what happens? Your trust builds. Can't you see that? Huh? You don't just give somebody, well, I'm going to give you a trust account. I'm going to put 100 billion trusts in that account for you. And you get 100 billion times... And if you reach the 100 million, then I won't trust you anymore. That's not the way it works. You start doing things by faith. That's how it really works. And every time they do not betray you, you trust them even more. Why would you do that to a human being and you will not do that with the living God? Take a step of faith. Employ the word. Utilize it. Walk by it. Live by it. Have it established. There's still time. You do not have all the time in the world. You have just enough time to work it out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That is to say, work it out in all truth. Having an understanding of the blessings and the consequences and the curses. That we can do. That's what you can do. That's what can be done. And again, the Lord awaits you. He has prepared everything. Everything. So hopefully everybody sees this, right? Hopefully everybody does. And somebody keeps saying Mixler is falling apart. Well, it probably would do that. He would do that today, wouldn't it? But we have a lot, we have some, we have uh, attempts, it looks like login attempts, a lot of, a lot of spikes on Mixler more than usual. A lot. But do you all see that? Do you all see that? My goodness. Well, I don't know about you. I'll just encourage my own soul. How about that? I'm listening to you, Mike. Let's keep going. All right. After all of this, after all of this, listen, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. After that thousand years, Satan is loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints about, the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
So it wasn't the beast this time. It wasn't the false prophet this time. It was Satan himself who deceived everybody. And he went out to deceive everybody he could deceive. Folks, listen up. That means when Satan was bound, this earth held human beings again. And they were among you, the glorified. So they were glorified people with Christ ruling and reigning, but they were regular human beings on the earth. Having seen the glory of the Lord, having seen those people, those people who had the witness of Jesus, who withstood the beast, his mark and the number of his name for the word of God. They saw them glorified in the earth. But then when Satan was loosed, even seeing, even having proof, they were still deceived. And they went and gathered themselves together to fight the living God and the saints. How stupid. God being who he is, he fulfilled his word. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And that devil that deceived them, he was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Because the beast and the false prophet are. And there they will be tormented, day and night, forever and ever. My point is, when Satan is bound, nobody is operating in darkness. And as soon as Satan is released again, he speaks by way of that darkness, and people begin to agree with sin again. And they go to fight the living God and his saints. You mean to tell me. Listen, listen, because it is it's, it's this very dumb mood. But that's what happens when Satan deceives. When we hear the voice of Satan by way of thoughts, by way of influences, by way of earthly doctrines when we hear it we begin to believe it and challenge the word of god not trusting it fully the only thing that can have a person not trust the word of god fully is the mouth of the dragon is satan himself if it were not for satan all of us would trust the word of god emphatically we would but because of satan we have reservations Hmm? My goodness. And when Satan is removed, all of a sudden, everybody, everybody has clarity of mind and thought. They don't challenge the word of God. But when Satan is loosed, what happens? He instantly deceives them again. Right now, you have reservations in the word of God because of what Satan is saying, not because of what your father is saying. So what that means, when we don't believe fully, we've been listening to Satan himself, his deceitful mouth. He's the one doing it. So what happens when a person no longer hears the words of fear, the words of doubt, the words of mistrust, Hmm? What happens when we no longer believe the lie of Satan that was sown in so many people's lives during their youth? Because in your youth, Satan tried to teach you that love is flawed, that love is painful, that love comes with consequences, that love is not fulfilling, that love is not so truthful. That's what he taught you, a bunch of lies. It's in the music, it's in the movies, it's everywhere. And it's magnified above the truth of our Lord. What happens when you shut that off, when you say, nope, you will not enter into my mind? What I'm telling you is that that deceitful voice is out there, and met all of us, once having listened to it and lived by it, God called us out of the world. It is time to let the rest go. Time to let the lie of the past go. 
the lie of your past is that something horrific happened to you that scarred and wounded you forever. That's a lie. That is not what your father says. That's not what happened. That is the deceiver. If your father did not relay it to you, it came from Satan. The Lord God Almighty has given nothing but holy counsel. Satan is the one that causes a person to believe in a lie. And how does Satan speak? By your situations. Now, when you're in a trial, a tribulation, a situation, or anything, you can perceive it one of two ways. You can find your father in it, or you can listen to the dragon. That's all up to you. Because we're not to walk by sight. You are not to believe your circumstances by your eyes. You're not. Time to see the truth of your past. Hmm? Time to see the truth of your past. Time to see your father in your past. You can see every situation in different ways. Time for you to choose. And again, I'll tell you something, and again, I'm going to say it again. When you trust the Lord, you're no longer challenging him. The only thing that can make you challenge the Lord is your mistrust of his process, your mistrust of his resolve in your life, and then you start to give heed to other voices that are not his. Trust is built by faith. You take a step of faith with your friends and family, and when they don't betray you, when they don't, you'll say, oh, he didn't betray me. You got a little trust there. You take another step by faith because you don't know who they are. Oh, they didn't betray me this time either. I double trust them. Then you take another step and they don't betray you. Oh, they did. I stepped again. They did not betray me. I triple trust them. We'll do that to human beings. What are we doing with our father? Hmm? People want so badly to trust another human being. But who wants to so badly trust the Messiah? See, that's why it's good to live in truth. Because the truth is we do not automatically trust the resolve of the Messiah. If that were so, we would have chosen his way a while ago. But we have reservations in the fullness of immersing ourselves in the word of God. We have reservations because the dragon, Satan, has lied to us. He has given us a narrative of our past. And let's go ahead and face it. We believed that before we believed the truth. Your past, your past was used as a weapon against you. But the truth of your past is it opened your eyes to see a specific type of darkness that is necessary in the days you live in now. Most of you, your children are not touched because of the devil that got to you. You know what that devil is. You know who that devil is. You can identify that devil and you said that devil is not coming near my children. Had you not gone through that, a devil would have gotten to your children. You prayed for someone to help you. No one came. But God answered your prayer anyway. How so, you may ask. Because when you prayed for someone to come to get you out of that situation, God prepared you to get the next one out of that situation. Huh? You're the one that can stop the cycle. You are. That's why you went through it. You were trained, bought up to break the curse. You broke the generational curse. You were the vessel that did that. That's why you went through it. Anybody who comes face to face with Satan and is scarred is empowered to see the devil that will get to somebody else. But because of you, now you can see it. And every time he's identified, he cannot operate. He can only operate if everybody is blind to him. 
so the Lord open your eyes. The process of opening somebody's eyes is for them to go through something. But you see the dilemma? No one naturally wants to go through anything, do they? You wouldn't choose to go through something like that, would you? That's why the Lord did not ask. You would have said no. But are you honored that you were able to be that vessel to break the generational curse from your own children, from your own, those people around you? Are you honored that the Lord had your past designed the way it was? If anything were to be altered, that curse would have gone forward. God already said that he would break that generational curse, didn't he? And he did that through you. See, somebody has to go first. Somebody has to go first. Somebody has to go first. Whoever goes first has to face the devil himself. Somebody has to go first. Somebody has to be empowered first. Don't they? Look at the Lord. Look at the prophets. How many of you could be immersed in poop up to your neck I still hold your peace and the word of God? Huh? How many of you could knowingly be tormented because of your innocence? And they know you're innocent. You know you're innocent, but they torment you anyway. And how many of you could hold your peace and the word of God in that situation? Go look at the prophets again. You're going to find that your story is similar to theirs. They had to go first. God does not send anybody forth with a lie. If he's going to send you to break anything, to break any darkness, you've got to have experience with that darkness. You have to be empowered to see that darkness. And you have been empowered. If you're a, a male and your dad beat your brains in or gave you no time at all, somebody had to go first. Because if that hadn't happened, you would have no compassion. And you know and I know it is that compassion that caused somebody else's life to be impacted in a good way. You could have been an abuser or a murderer. Not because you were abused and close to killed by your own dads. You refused to let that darkness travel or to reach somebody else. And so inside you have a declaration that you will not take that road. The Lord did that for you. The only reason you won't take that path it's because that path sickens you. And you can see the people and their dispositions and see everybody who's potentially on that path now. You can hear the cry of someone where nobody else can. The Lord has empowered you beyond belief. But listen to me. If you curse your past, you'll deny the gift. Anybody who wants that gift has to go through what you went through. The Lord just doesn't lay something like that in somebody's lap. That's an authentic gift. That's a real gift. Why do you think the virgin said, go back and get your own oil? You cannot share oil. It comes at a high price. Oil is gained over the course of your life through the myriad of trials you have gone through. Once you go through those things... That's when you have oil to keep your faith going. My faith only continues because of the Lord showing up in my life. Because of all the rotten stuff, yet I am kept. Because of the things I caused, yet he gave me favor. See, nobody right now today, if everybody gave up on the Lord and said they didn't believe and the Bible was proven wrong, I would say I still believe. And the only reason I would say that 
is because of all the troubles in my life. Not the good times, the troubles. The troubles have fueled my faith. And nothing to date has been able to break it. That is oil. Oil keeps the flame going. Without the oil, the flame goes out. Without the oil, there's no faith. And in that parable, when they said, share some of your oil with us, they said, no, you had to go back and buy your own. It comes with a price. You have to go back and pay your own price for your own oil to keep your faith going. In other words, you've got to live in somebody else's shoes, and that takes too long. Don't curse the oil. The Lord has put in your lamps. That price you paid was high. So be it. Oil is expensive. Don't you know? It's not developed overnight. Hmm? Do you see that? And some of you have some pretty refined oil. That falling away that we read about in the Bible. That day now shall not come lest there come a falling away and that man of perdition be revealed. Do you know what that means? Many are going to turn away from the faith. Not those with oil. People can go and try and prove every single origin story they want outside of the word of God. They can say life exists on every single planet out there. It is not going to change nor alter my faith because of the oil. It will not. There are those out there, they have a flame. I'm telling you now, they have no oil. And the first time it gets rough, they're gone. But God gave me oil. That's my oil. I can't share it with anybody. And the only way to get that oil is for a person to go back and pay the price for their own. I hope you see that. Because the call has gone out. Can't you tell? The call has gone out that is coming. It's already gone out. And what are people saying in their heart of hearts? I'm going to tell you, if you remember that parable, the call went out, didn't it? That is coming. Those virgins, they woke up. All of them were virgins. Five wise and five foolish. They were all awakened. Not all made it. Right now, in the souls of men, they know that things are changing. People can try to ignore it. They can try to replace Right? What's going on? They try to say aliens are doing it. Global warming is doing it. They have all been awakened. Some have oil. Some do not. The ones who cannot maintain their faith, they're asking the others, how, do you, how, how are you maintaining yourself? I can't do that. How are you doing that? See, the ones that have oil, they've gone through something. You've been awakened. Now what's happening is people are curious to, to see why you're not believing fully in all these other doctrines out there. Why are you stuck on the word of God so people behind it? I can't do that. My mind is drifting. I don't believe enough. It's because we have oil. And you cannot share it. You can't share. So the virgins have been awakened. All of them have. Because a call has gone out that is coming. And the command is going out right now to light your lamps. Trim them and light them. You know it's going out. That's the urgency you've been feeling for such a long time. See, it comes and goes, doesn't it? You'll know we're in a serious time, and then it relaxes. Then that serious, have you ever tried to do something? You say, well, you know, I'm going to have a plan for five years. Then a thought hits you. You don't have five years. What are you doing? See, that's the urgency. Trim those wicks. 
Get your lamps ready. Light them. The night is coming. When people start seeing the night coming, I'm telling you what they're going to do. They're going to come to those who do believe and say, how do you do it? What is the procedure? And you're going to tell, I can't give you a procedure for that. That's built over the course of your life. And there's a high price to pay. You have to go back. Go back into the world and buy your own oil. In other words, pay your own price for that oil in the world. You have to go through the whole process to get this oil. And as they go back and attempt it, there's not enough time. You know what that means? If they're finally, if they finally want the oil of those who truly believe, then all their doctrines fell apart. That's what it means. All the narratives they had fell apart. That's what it means. And they're going to come to the Christians whose narrative stayed the same, whose faith did not fall apart, and they're going to say, teach me now. Now I'm ready to listen. Well, see, if I can't help you, that's what you're going to say. I can't help you now. This you have to experience to have it. I have no words to tell you with this except that it comes with a price. Do you know how many doctrines and narratives and beliefs are out there? All of them are going to fail. Then they're coming to you. When all their stuff falls apart and blows up in their face, they're going to come to those who truly believe in Christ, and they're going to say, how do I do it? I'm ready to listen, and you're not going to be able to help them because you're going to know, just like I know right now, that if you don't live through specific things, you'll never have the trust factor to continue in those steps of faith. That takes a lifetime to get worked out. And it comes at a very high cost. Those foolish virgins, that's part of the falling away. Those are the ones that fall away. You've been suffering most of your life. Your life is highly challenged. That's so you can have oil. They've been skating through everything. Those are the ones who get away with everything. You go out in a group, you're the one that's punished and everybody else goes free. Did you notice that? Why were you the one who did not get away scot-free? Why were you the one the penalty fell so heavy on? Why were you the one that couldn't get it like everybody else? Why were you the one? God determined you to have oil. That's why. He was not willing to lose you. You thought it was a disadvantage. You thought it was some sort of conspiracy, some weird thing. Bad luck. No. It's your father saying this one's going to have oil. This one's going all the way home. God knows when he's sending the night, and the night is coming where no man can work. No one gets through that door without a lamp that is burning and lit. And when God shuts the door, nobody can open that up again. And the process has already begun. Folks, I'm going to see you tomorrow. Tomorrow's actually Thursday, not today. Right? I know I burned up all this time. It's okay. It's all right. We'll be back tomorrow to continue this. And we have summaries coming up for the book of Revelation that I'll put on our schedule. I'm going to say God bless all of you.